Okay, so we are in the middle of the study of Samson. Last week when we dealt with chapter 13, this was just a very, very nice story. We focused on the person I called Mrs. Manoach and uh, his mother, Samson's mother. And we learned a whole, a great deal in great detail about the prophecy that preceded his birth. The very last sentence of, of uh, chapter 13 is a, is a sentence that we're gonna see repeatedly the similar kind of idea throughout the story of Samson. The spirit of the Lord began to move within the camp of Dan between Tzorah and Eshtaol. And uh, that tells us something. We know from the very beginning of his birth, he is selected from before his birth, he's selected and he is going to be a Nazarite, which gives you a sense that there's a certain holiness or separation or something that's being required of him, um, uh, unique to other people in the area. And then at the end of the chapter, we learn that there's a special spirit of the Lord. And now it doesn't say um, that the spirit of Lord came upon Samson, but it does say that the spirit of the Lord began to be felt in the entire area of Don, which of course is where Samson is. So you have a sense that as a result of Samson's very existence before he's ever even done anything, um, when we learn, first of all, that God blesses him, but then before he has even done anything, there's a spirit moving there in the camp. And this is kind of our introduction. So when we get to chapter 14, we would expect, except many of us already know the story, but pretend you don't know the story. Our expectation would be that we're going to learn a story of a person who is, on the one hand, a very holy man, a person who is righteous, a person who fits the image we might have of a righteous leader, a holy man, someone who is very conscious and, and tuned in to what God wants. But at the same time, we're expecting him to save the day. We're expecting him to be another one of those saviors um, that, has, that God has appointed throughout the book of Judges. And that is as a result of the very beginning of chapter 13, where we learn in a very similar pattern that we've seen before, that the Israelites sinned, and that God placed them in the hands of the Philistines. In other words, they're being oppressed by the Philistines for 40 years. And then we have this whole story about the birth of Samson. So our expectation is that Samson will be both a holy man and a savior. So let's see if our expectations are met. Chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah. And while in Timnah, he noticed a girl among the Philistine women. Now, of course, there are a few women that Samson gets involved in. None of them come out good. And this is going to be something that we will be discussing this week and next as we explore Samson. What is Samson's deal with women? Okay, and this is one of the things we're trying to figure out because usually if we're thinking of a person that God placed in a particular position as a savior, we don't like to think of a person like that as someone who's a, a, chase, a women chaser looking after the skirts or whatever. You know, this, it's, it's not appropriate, okay? But this is our first introduction to Samson. He sees a woman, not just any woman, a Philistine woman. Okay, now we already know from the Bible, from Deuteronomy, uh, from, you know, in general, everything that we've ever learned in the Bible is that the Israelites are supposed to stay within their own. They are not supposed to marry the Canaanites or any of the other, other nations that are living with them uh, in Canaan. And in fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, we know that one of the things that Moses repeats and later Joshua repeats um, before he dies, get rid of these other nations to prevent the kind of intermarriage assimilation and particularly bad influences. Uh, and the kind of bad influences that Joshua refers to and that are also referred to by Moses is mostly pagan influences, but it's not just worshiping uh, the wrong God but it's also taking on pagan culture and pagan habits were very often very immoral. Okay, so this suddenly occurs, might take us by surprise. What is he looking at a Philistine woman for? Okay, and what happens afterwards? On his return, he tells his father and mother, I noticed one of the Philistine women in Timnah, please get her for me as a wife. Okay, 
Now you may think that this get her for me as a wife is a little, you know, barbaric, but it really isn't because we are talking about a, um, uh, well, it's not the nicest way to speak, but on the other hand, we're talking about a, a very patriarchal society. The men rule the roost and a woman is taken as a wife. Now, the people that have to agree to this is the father of the woman, not the woman itself, although we have a precedent for the woman agreeing. And that is, of course, when Eliezer comes to find a wife for Isaac and his and he, of course, is negotiating with Laban and with Bethuel. But in the end, the family asks Rebecca, do you want to go with this man? And only after she's yes, she says yes, then her parents release her to go with Eliezer. Um, we also have another uh, situation. Um, now we are um, reading the Torah portions. You know, we're in Genesis, and this week's Torah portion is Vaishlach. And there we have the uh, story of the rape of Dina by the people of Bashem and Hamor's father, and the people of that area, which is the area of Shechem. And uh, what is the language there? The, also, after he rapes her, of course, first he rapes her, he tries her out, decides, hey, you know, I like her. She's, she's, she's for me. You know, I think she's for me. So then he wants to, you know, have some kind of a, a he wants to actually marry her. And um, and he says, uh, what's his name? She Shechem comes to his parents and says, take me this girl for a wife. And it's exactly the same verb, take me. So, you know, take to me or take take it for me. So it's clearly a pattern in the ancient world. Uh, again, I don't know if it's the nice way of doing it. There are better ways of doing it, but uh, it's clearly part of the norm. Okay, so basically he likes this girl and he wants his parents to arrange the marriage. And his father and his mother, now it's very interesting. We, in last week's uh, lesson, we talked about in chapter 13, how Mrs. Manoach seemed to be on a much higher spiritual level than Manoach himself, uh, who we called Mrs. Manoach's husband. But, you know, seriously now, you know, the, but here you will see that he has a very positive relationship with both of his parents. Uh, he goes to ask both of his parents to take for a wife, and it's both of his parents that answer him. So there's really quite unity, and that's a very positive thing in his upbringing that both parents are speaking in the same voice. They have clearly not only have a positive relationship with him, both of them, but they are clearly speaking in the same voice. They are consistent. That's also always something that is good and good to remember. So his father and mother said to him, is there no one among the daughters of your own kinsmen among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And that of course, that the, the Philistines are even worse than some of the other nations. Because some of the other nations in the area are also circumcised. The ancient area, uh, it is not rare for somebody, you know, to be circumcised. Um, and in fact, today, uh, it's interesting, but the Arabs are all circumcised, um, just as a by the by. But the Philistines are not. And we discussed how the Philistines here are Philistines who came in from the West, probably from the Greek islands. So... Uh, here, I believe what he's saying is not, it's not enough that they're not from our own people. They're a different nation than the Philistines, but they're even further removed from these other nations that live among us that have some of our similar customs. They're the uncircumcised Philistines. But Samson answered his father, get me that one for she is the one that pleases me. Well, he has his heart set on her and that's all she wants. Okay. And what does it say next? His father and mother did not realize that this was the Lord's doing, that this was from God. He was seeking a pretext against the Philistines for the Philistines who were ruling over Israel at that time. Now, first of all, this word pretext, the word itself in Hebrew is to'ana, and it is not a, it's not a word that really appears uh, before in the Bible. So really the way they understand that it means either pretext is I've seen different uh, translations, but they're all very similar pretext an excuse an opportunity. Uh, and it's clearly a definition of the word that comes from its context. It's clear that that is what the, uh, the sentence is, but it's interesting in that there seems to be some difference of opinion as to who it is 
that is seeking the pretense. Now, in my English, now, first of all, in Hebrew, there is no capital letters, okay? It's all the same letters. So when you have a pronoun and the pronoun is he, okay, how do you know who it is? Now, it's very interesting because in my English translation, um, the pronoun is a capital H. He was seeking a pretext against the Philistines. And I'm not clear if in my, it's, it's a capital H because the he refers to God or the capital H because it's after the colon and then you would capitalize the H. I don't know. Okay. But it does reflect a certain um, dis, dis, you know, disagreement as to who is the he. Okay. We say the parents do not realize that this is from God because he is seeking a pretext against the Philistines. Is he God or is he Samson? Okay. And it really can go either way. Uh, I mean, grammatically, it could go either way uh, because it can be that the whole situation is a situation that God created. Okay. But the person who is seeking the, the, the pretext and who's going to use the situation in such a way is Samson. Okay. So basically you're saying, here's Samson, this guy, here's these Philistines, here's this woman, okay? Um, God created the situation to give Samson opportunities to get into the Philistines, okay? But, but Samson himself is the one who's saying, oh, look at this opportunity. If I can marry a Philistine woman, that's gonna get me in the good graces or at least give me access to Philistines at a level that I don't have otherwise. Now, that's very similar to the kind of things that a spy will do. And actually, there's a lot of discussion in Israel. Well, not a lot of discussion because it's so top secret, but it is something that is discussed. You know, in all secret services, there is an element of um, relationships between men and women in order to gather information, in order to save lives, in order to do all kinds of stuff. Every country has that. Is that okay? I mean, we will say um, it is not okay to just use a woman or have a relationship outside of marriage or anything like that. And yet, uh, is it okay to do that in the context of a spy service when you're doing this in order to save lives? And that's a question I will just kind of leave up there. But it could very well be that that is where Samson is coming from. He's saying, this is an opportunity, like any good spy, I'm going to take advantage of it. The question, therefore, is who is seeking the pretext is critical. Was it God who actually wanted Samson to go after this woman? Or is it Samson in the context of knowing his ultimate goal, which is to get in with the Philistines? But is he the one who decides to do it through this woman? And I leave that question open. And I, but I think that actually the, the verse itself, you can read it either way. Okay, anyway, and of course we have as an after effect something we already know for the Philistines were ruling Israel at that time. So Samson and his father and mother went down to Timnah. We don't really know how it is that Samson managed to convince his parents because it says his parents did not realize what Samson's ultimate goal was, okay? But yet he managed to convince him. And from this, it seems that he's just stubborn. He says, get me that one for she is the one that pleases me. It doesn't, it doesn't see, it says his parents didn't know the ultimate reason. So clearly he just was being stubborn. So from their perspective, they probably did not think it was such a good idea. Anyway, so Samson and his father and mother go down to Timnah. And again, he's going with both his parents. And it would very often be the kind of thing that the fathers would do this negotiation. But in the case of Samson, both parents are involved. So that's also, you know, I think interesting in terms of the relationship between him and his parents. Uh, when he came and they came, uh, they came, okay, here it's very interesting because my, um, my English translation is really wrong. Okay, the Hebrew said they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And here uh, was a full grown, and here was a, a, a 
full grown lion. No, it's a baby lion. Oh, the English is all wrong. Whatever. Uh, it's the way the Hebrew really were, reads is that, and they came to the vineyards of Timna, and suddenly, okay, they see this young lion roaring, coming towards him to attack, but it says coming towards him. So the question, of course, is it seems to be that he's going with his parents to Timna, and together they came to the vineyards. But then when the lion comes to attack, Someone is only attacking Samson. So um, rather than change the translation, we can figure this out. And it's just that together they go to the vineyards. Samson, and I read this somewhere, but it just makes a lot of sense. Samson is going to hang out in the vineyards while his parents go into town to meet the parents. I mean, all we know so far is Sam said, I want that girl. Someone's got to go make the arrangements. So they go together to Timna, but he says, they says to Sam, so you wait out here. We're going to go in. We'll meet the parents and we'll make an, we'll make a contract. We'll make an arrangement, see what happens. Okay. While he's waiting in the vineyards and his parents have already gone. Okay. He's attacked by this lion. What next happens? The spirit of the Lord came upon him. Okay. So this is different from what we saw before. Before at the end of chapter 13, we see that the spirit of the Lord is in the area. Now we have the spirit of the Lord is upon Samson himself. It's much more specific and he tears apart, apart okay? He tears apart this lion as if it were a little billy goat, okay? And it, it, it's insane to picture it, even if it's a, a baby lion, a kfir is, is a baby lion, not a baby, not a cub, but a younger lion is still a lion is a lion. And for him to be able to tear this apart is certainly rather amazing. And, and scripture tells us that he has nothing in his hands. He's, he's, he's just using his bare hands. He doesn't have any swords or any kind of instruments like that. But he didn't tell his mother and father what he had done. Okay. So you picture this. They go off and he's there waiting for them. Okay. Uh, and then he goes down and he speaks to the woman and she pleads Samson. So what's missing here is his parents must have gone and said, okay, you can come now. The family's ready to entertain this relationship. And he goes down and for the first time actually meets this woman and he likes her. Okay. So they make the arrangements and he, he returns and as he goes home and then in verse eight, we say, and he returns, he returns the following year uh, to marry her, to take her in Hebrew. Okay. To take her, but it means to marry her. And that of course, is the parallel when he says to his parents, take her for me, taking her means to marry. Uh, and there is a period of engagement. So they go first to the family, they make the arrangements, everybody goes home. And then after some months or after a year, um, Samson comes back in order to actually have the wedding. And again, we're gonna have a very similar situation where he and his parents are both going, but there's a time where they're separated. So it says here, he comes back to take her, and he turned aside to look at the remains of the lion. And in the lion's skeleton, he found a swarm of bees and honey. Or it could be a bee's hive. A beehive was there uh, and honey. Okay. He scooped it out into his palms and ate it as he went along. When he rejoined his father and mother. So from this, we learned they came together. They were going to Timna to have the wedding. And at this point, the parents probably again go into the city. He stays back because he wants to go make a detour to where he was before. See whatever happened to that lion. He finds his bones with some honey, okay, and some bees. And he did not tell his parents that he had scooped the honey out of a lion skeleton, okay? So all these things that happening, the attack of the lion, the coming back to bees, nobody knows about any of this except him, Samson. He didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell his parents to anybody. And of course, this becomes relevant as the story progresses. So his father came down to the woman and Samson made a feast there as young men used to do. So we're at the wedding. Okay. And here we have a bachelor party. Okay. I don't know where the mother is. The mother is probably with the women, with the bride's women, whatever. But here Samson is with, is making a bachelor party uh, in honor of his wedding. And his father joins him. Okay. The only Israelites here in this bachelor party is Samson and his father. These guys are, you know, they're Philistines. How do we know? When they saw him, they designated 30 companions to be with him. He comes by himself. 
He's an Israelite going to marry a Philistine. Nobody in the Israelite camp is joining him. This is not something you are supposed to do. So he's coming as an outsider to this, to his own wedding with nobody. So it's like, it's kind of think about it as a, you know, bridesmaids and, and groomsmen, you know, every, the groom needs men and he didn't bring any men with him. So they're going to sign the men to him. They give him 30 men. And of course, Samson is going to use all of this to his benefit afterwards. Then Samson said to them, let me propose a riddle to you. If you can give me the right answer during the seven days of the feast, I shall give you 30 linen tunics and 30 sets of, of clothing. But if you are not able to tell it to me, you must give me 30 linen tunics and 30 sets of clothing. So he's, he's saying, I'm going to do a riddle. And he's doing it as, um, on the one hand, it's a game. And it's probably very common at a bachelor's party to do games. But here, he's putting very high stakes because this is a lot of clothing here and expensive clothing. Okay, so he's basically saying, um, we're going to rate wager. And if I win, you have to give me all of this stuff. And if you win, I have to give you all these stuff. And they said to him, ask your riddle, and we will listen. But they're so confident, you know, oh, this one little Israelite from that, you know, stupid nation over there. What kind of riddle can he possibly ask that we won't know? So they don't think about the economic consequences that could happen to them if they lose. They're confident they're going to win. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. For three days, they could not answer the riddle. Now, we, we know what happened. This riddle is, is not a fair riddle because it is based on a particular incident. The, uh, the lion that attacked him, that then became bones, that has this a beehive in it and, and, and honey. Okay, so this is based on something that only Samson knows. And scripture has been very, very, make sure to tell us Samson has told nobody. The only one he would have told were his parents and he didn't tell them. So there's no way they could find out. So on purpose, he's asking them a riddle that there's no way in the world they could have known the answer unless they had supernatural help, okay? And that's also something here because basically Samson is saying, oh, if they're supposed to know this, then God will make sure they know it, which of course is not gonna happen. On the seventh day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband to provide us with the answer to the riddle else we shall put you and your father's household to the fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? Well, this is a pretty nasty group of people. They not only go to her and say, you know, I understand this. You're going to go, you're going to do anything. You go to the wife, oh, use your feminine wiles. Please try to get the answer out of him. All that is fine, except they don't just do that. They threaten her and they say, if you don't, get us the answer, we will burn you and your entire family and household to bits. These are horrible people, absolutely horrible people. They're threatening their own with this terrible violence so that they can save themselves to, to pay uh, Samson the 30 tunics and the 30 uh, clothing, okay, 30 sets of clothing. But And, and they make it clear that that's their uh, motive because they said, have you invited us here to impoverish us? All they care about is money. And they're willing to burn everything, including this woman and her family, so to save themselves some money. So Samson's wife, you know, um, cried before him. Here it says he, she harassed him. She harassed him with tears, whatever. She, she cried before him and pleaded with him. And she said, you really hate me. You don't love me. You asked my countrymen a riddle and you didn't tell me the answer. You asked my countrymen a riddle. Now, for those of you who were thinking, oh, really, it's really fine for Samson to marry a Philistine. We're all equal, you know, kumbaya. Everybody loves one another. Both Samson's family and the girl herself understand that this is a marriage between two different peoples. And from the, this moment, she, the wife, realizes, what are you doing? You are asking me to go against my own countrymen. So we know right away where she stands. We know, of course, where Samson stands. This is an impossible marriage. Impossible. And we know that Samson does not see this as a real marriage. For him, he is utilizing her, taking advantage in order to 
work his way into the Philistines. He replied, I haven't even told my father and mother. Should I tell you? But clearly, what does the Bible say? Then you should leave your father and mother and stick to your wife. And what does Samson say? I first am devoted to my father and mother. None of this leave my father and mother stuff, you know. And so his, he's saying to her, my, if I haven't told my father and mother, I certainly wouldn't tell you. So in, in Samson's eyes, she's not really a wife, not in the, you know, full encompassing set of the word. During the rest of the seven days of the feast, she continued to harass him with her tears. And on the seventh day, he told her because she nagged him so. This will become Samson's downfall. He cannot withstand a woman's tears. And we see it here, and we're going to see it at the very end. This is Samson's weakness. And she explained the riddle to her countrymen. So, no, you know, he, he told her the answer. On the seventh day before the sunset, the townsmen said to him, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? So they solved the riddle. He responded, had you not plowed with my heifer, you would not have guessed my riddle. In other words, he said, okay, you got with my wife. Now he here uses a, a, a word, a, a, a term plowed with my heifer that would imply taking her to bed. Okay, which is not what happened. What really happened was they threatened her. And it's very interesting because you have to wonder, did Samson know the extent to which she was intimidated to plead with him? Or did, she, did he just think it was my people versus your people? They got in bed with her, et cetera. Okay. And it could have gone really either way, as we see at the end. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. Again, this is a, an indication if the spirit of the Lord is coming on him now, that God is okay with this whole scheme. Okay? He went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of its men. He stripped them and gave the sets of clothing to those who had answered the riddle. And he left in a rage for his father's house. Samson's wife then married one of those who had been his wedding companions. Okay, now this is very interesting. Verse 20. It doesn't say someone took Samson's wife and gave her to the wedding campaigns and said she she just she became or she was became one or here it says married it doesn't really say married in in the text it says and she uh she she the wife of samson became belonging to or became of one of the friends okay so it's one of those 30 guys ends up taking her okay or she goes to him it's not quite clear Let's continue just the beginning of chapter 15 uh, because it is, it's all part of the same story, okay? Sometime later in the season of the wheat harvest, Samson came to visit his wife, bring a kid as a gift. So you can see from Samson's point of view, what happened in verse 20, the end is not that she married somebody else. Maybe she's shacking up with somebody else. Maybe she came under the protection of somebody else. But from his perspective, she's still his wife. So she comes to bring her a kid as a gift. He said, let me go into the chamber to my wife, but her father would not let him go in. I was sure, said her father, you had taken a dislike to her. So I gave her to your wedding companion, but her younger sister is more beautiful than she let her become your wife instead. Thereupon Samson declared, now the Philistines can have no claim against me for the harm I shall do them. At this point, he just says, you know, I am vindicated. You did me a wrong. You took my wife away from me. Therefore, I can do whatever I want. Samson went and caught 300 foxes. He took torches and turning the foxes tail to tail, he placed a torch between each pair of tails. He lit the torch and turned the foxes loose among the standing grain of the Philistines, setting fire to stacked grain, standing grain, vineyards, and olive trees. The Philistines asked who did this, and they were told it was Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, who took Samson's wife and gave her to his wedding companion. Thereupon, the Philistines came up and put her and her father to the fire. Samson said to them, if that is how you act, I will not rest until I've taken revenge on you. He gave them a sound and thorough thrashing. Then he went down and stayed in the cave of the rock of Atom. And we'll stop here. Very interesting. 
because that very threat that those 30 friends, supposed friends, those guys or whatever, threatened the wife and said, if you don't give us the riddle, we will burn you and your parents, your whole house down, is exactly what happened at the end anyway. These are very violent, horrible people. And it ended, and it happened uh, as a result of this whole situation. And basically, Samson manipulates the situation on the one hand, but on the other hand, every single thing that these people do, they do of their own volition. He doesn't threaten them. He doesn't, he kills them only after they, you know, they, they, they trick him or whatever. He basically allows them to do the evil things. And then he responds and he responds violently. He responds, you know, in such a way that he's really um, defeating them, but in a very different way that we would expect a savior of Israel, that the spirit of the Lord has come upon him. So we will end here, but I would like to begin next week's discussion with a discussion of, is this how you would picture the spirit of the Lord coming upon the savior? Is this the kind of behavior that you would expect from someone who the spirit of the Lord has come upon? Him? Fair enough? Any questions or comments right now while we're in the middle of the story? I just wanted to say in the stone Tanakh, um, the he, the letter H is in lowercase. So you got to say it, it was Samson that they were talking Samson, about. Samson, that's right. Yeah. I, I personally think that it was Samson. I do believe that that is more, because, and this is part of what we're going to discuss next time. What it was that God was doing and what it was that Samson was doing. And was Samson doing everything that he should have done or did he, you know, kind of move off what those God gave him a lot of opportunities and potentials. Did Samson utilize that properly or did he kind mm -hmm. of go in a different direction? So if we say that Samson is seeking this opportunity, that it's the, he is Samson. I think it goes along with this question we have. Is this really what God had in mind? Yeah. I don't but, know. I always know, with Samson, it. with Samson, he had this distinct personality of getting angry very fast. And I think God used that personality of his. Yeah, I think that's very possible. Hmm. These were not, and another thing is we saw in the story, these were not good guys. Right. They were violent people. Any other comments now before we um, break for the week? Yeah. Well, I always read it or understood that it was the Lord that was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. That, that he was really there behind it all. Okay. But okay. you've given me, you've, you've definitely given me, given me something to think about. Well, I think but, we have to be very careful when we read this. There's no question that the beginning, this is from God, is from God. That's that part of the sentence we're not changing. His mm -hmm. parents did not know that this was from God. Mm -hmm. Or he was seeking an opportunity, a pretext, whatever, uh, from the Philistines. It's just that part of it. Who is he is seeking? The opportunity, the, the picture yeah. is from God. The question is, who is actually seeking that pretext in this way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's no question yeah. that we have a lot to talk about. We will continue discussing Samson, both in chapter 14 and onward. <laughs> Uh, into, well, we've already started um, mm -hmm. chapter uh, 15, uh, and we'll continue with that, but we'll also have uh, continued discussions about this. So have a wonderful week, and see you next Thank week. You. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank Sandra. Bye-bye. You. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. 
check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.